Hi, welcome to the Freeman Conversations. I'm Joe Bertocco, the online editor of Freeman. And I'm very excited today because in the studio is a veteran journalist who has been the face and the voice of news and media in Tubagueta City and Negros Oriental. And she has kindly given us her time to be with the Freeman Conversations today. Please welcome Mrs. Glinda Desquatan. Ma'am, thank you very much for joining You're us welcome. today. Mom, Mom it's a Glinda. privilege, Joe. <laughs> Mom Glinda is now the Visayas Manager of the Regional Media Solutions of Filipino Cable Corporation. Mom thank Glinda, you. Yes. You've been a journalist for as long as I can remember. <laughs> That's so revealing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how, has the, how has covering Dumaguete and Negros been for you? Okay. You know, um, well, as Joe Bertha mentioned, I've been in the industry for really in decades, you know. I started as a student announcer. It was kind of exciting during those times. I'm a product of the first quarter storm. Uh, I graduated in 1972 at Silliman. And then when I joined the radio station, which is actually DYSF, of the mm -hmm. National Council of Churches in the Philippines, and yeah. maybe those who are viewing us right now who, are, who were in Dumaguete during those times, would recall that um, those were the exciting years of radio. Yeah, you know, and because at that point in time, it was radio, radio that dominated. Oh yes, yes, yes. It was a dominant medium. It was the one that uh, the people would look forward to when it comes yeah. to news, um, opinion, and you know, and everything. And so, what what, what happened then was. Um, I was enrolled as an economic student at Silliman University. Interesting. But, yes, yeah. interesting. But, you know, interestingly, <laughs> I also noticed that when you have a different discipline, uh, when you have different, like if you're in social sciences and everything, it gives you a much better appreciation of the issues of the day when you're doing hard work journalism. And, of course, different perspectives. Yeah, different perspectives. And so that's how I started, and then of course, you know, you graduated, and then you worked, and worked as a researcher, and then came back, and then of course did news. Uh, Why did you go to the OASR? What, what brought you to the radio work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, apart from the fact that I was a student announcer, okay? okay. I was discovered when I was, it's amazing, and it's kind of interesting. I was in the elementary school, and that was my first, uh, that I was discovered, I did. I did a very short declamation piece, <laughs> which was entitled "The Three Little Kittens Lost Their Ribbons," and, and and somehow the the program director liked what happened, and so from then on I was invited in high school to guest, and so when I went to Silliman as a working student, I already was thinking maybe I should apply at the radio station. Mm. And so that's that's how it started. And then I was exposed to real lady work, covering elections, you know. Yeah. And uh, and working side by side with the passionate broadcasters of NCCP. Mm -hmm. We were not a commercial radio station then. And uh, you are actually exposed to the basic advocacy of the church relative to human rights, relative to integrity of creation, and you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're exposed into that kind of environment, you develop a kind of uh, sternness uh, to look at things differently. Yeah. Okay? So and I think I'm really grateful that that was the experience that I had. So uh, looking back, um, you, we just celebrated, you just celebrated exciting Breast Freedom Week. Breast Freedom Week. I would share uh, what is contemporary media, I think, to my observation. In yes, Italy. please. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But um, when I was working with a radio station moving from newscaster, a news writer, newscaster, opinion... Quick question. Mm -hmm. Why did you not pursue a constitution degree? Yeah. <laughs> I was... Uh, not to... Well, not, not to put your, your <laughs> profession down, you know. But I was comfortable with with business administration and economics and looking at an entirely different perspective and then at the same time hone my broadcasting skills as a worker, as a okay. student worker. Okay. And so I was mentored by some of the best like Fred Cafe uh, at that time and, and all the others who were at radio station, Tax Bernardes, these were really the ones that I look up to, Johnny Pia, that really came out with crisp and focusy and uh, and uh, op 
opinions and you, you get to experience things like that. Yeah. So through the years, I moved and then became program director. I covered strikes and everything. I'd like to share that there was one session, which probably is an insight for other organizations in media. Mm -hmm. We wanted to expand the coverage job of, uh, of events all over Negros Oriental. Mm -hmm. So what we did at that time was we primarily, primarily Sky Cable and the other no, news still, organizations. It's, yes, other news organizations and DYSR and Sky Cable and other news organizations. What we did was we identified a correspondent per town. Mm. Okay. And then we brought them together in Dumaguete for a training. Okay, training in writing, training basically not just writing, but there was a well I was I came from a church radio, so there was a biblical theological reflection of what this job is all about, you know, to capacitate you when it comes to uh, the kind of integrity that is required. And then we taught them the basics of uh, the traditional, the who, when, where, you know, yeah. the four W's and the list of W's and one H, you know. And then, but to aid them, uh, to aid them, we provided them some kind of a template where you're supposed to write the highlights of what you're supposed to mm -hmm. report on. These are students or professionals? These are professionals. Some are okay. professionals, some are pastors, some are, some are from the from the market, some are businessmen, yeah. you know. But these are those who applied and those who also were recommended. Mm -hmm. You see, during that time, uh, the radio station was heard all over the province. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to reach out and interact with them. They give a call and they make a report mm -hmm. and then we bring them once in a while. And it enriched us actually because mm -hmm. you, how many radio reporters do we have at that time? They didn't cover. Yes. I was about to point out yeah. that even if radio has a wide reach, mm -hmm. uh, signal-wise or frequency-wise, yeah. yeah. you only have very few people Precisely. actually doing the legwork, the journalism has to tell yeah. us. Uh -huh. So you need to, to reach out by transfer of knowledge mm -hmm. and identifying community representatives. And I think it's good because if you are a radio station that goes into that kind of approach, you get closer to the people that you cover. Mm -hmm. And when there is something that happens in Gihulnan or something that happens in Bayouan, you get to get the information firsthand by someone who lives there. Yeah. Uh, someone yeah. who has a firsthand information who can look at the incident and be able to talk to people in that And area. Negros is quite yes. a big island. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. So we, we chose actually those areas where we think there are a lot more activities that are happening. So there's Bali's correspondent, there's Tanhai correspondent, there's a correspondent in Bihulian, the bigger in population. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you know, that, that, actually, that actually worked. And uh, how long allowed, did it last? It did last for years, you know, it did last for years. It, in fact, it expanded. And I think some of the radio stations follow suit. They have their own local correspondence even mm -hmm. up to now. Mm -hmm. You know, if you listen to the radio stations in Dumaguete, they do have very effective local correspondents. So it is now more or less institutionalized by some mm -hmm. of the some of the outlets in media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's the you know, I think that's the background. Uh, some of the exciting events that happen, especially when the radio station was closed for a while. Yeah. You know, if you, you know during martial, martial law, law. Yes. during martial law. And Sullivan University too, you know. And I think when I look back, um, there was there were some radio programs at that time that really uh, analyzed the, the social situation in the country done mm -hmm. by students. I see. Okay. okay. So I remember there was a program that I hosted together with one student called Enter the Young, mm -hmm. and Enter the Young really lambasted. Uh, all the happenings in government at that time were marked yes. outside, even outside of campus yes. issues, uh, community issues. Yes, a lot of community issues. And uh, um, there was, of course, the more progressive student organizations, such as the League of Filipino Students. Mm -hmm. There was the Socialist Christian Movement, you know. There were so many organizations that prioritized the, the political happenings of the country at that time. And I, mm -hmm. I think these programs were basically instrumental in, 
in uh, having the government decide not to reopen the radio station when it was closed. Mm. Okay, Jerry Marshall ruled. And so, you know, looking back, Joe Berth, it allows you to take a look at contemporary Philippines, you yes. know, yes. when you are in the when you are a product of that particular season, right, right. and you are in contemporary uh, Philippines, right? You've, you've seen things. Yes, you've seen how things. How they change and develop. Yeah. Right, and uh, I was just talking to some of my younger um, members of the of the church that that I that I spoke to, and I was telling them it is worse to forget, but it's you know it is still. The, the worst thing to happen is when you disremember, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when things happen and you think you forget, but then when you remember, you don't remember really the right things that you're supposed to remember, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, well, I think the challenge, we were talking earlier, by the way, yeah. Robert and I, <laughs> when we were traveling here, <laughs> we were talking Navigating about... Navigating through uh, Cebu traffic. <laughs> Wow, that's really something. Yeah, yeah. That traffic really was something. <laughs> anyway, um, we were, you were celebrating Presbyterian Week, and yes. I heard it was exciting. Huh? It's always very exciting every year because that's when news organizations and journalists all over Cebu come together uh, to number one discuss our issues mm -hmm. and the challenges that we face, and also to for fellowship. That's when we are friends for a week. <laughs> it's a we set aside, yes, that's that. when we set aside competition for a week. Uh -huh. But that's also the time when we bring in colleagues from, from Manila to okay. talk in the forum okay. that we organize. Uh -huh. the, the Freeman and Banat News, for example, since we belong to one um, family, the Freeman and Banat News organized a forum entitled uh, Journalism and blogging in the age of fake news. Mm -hmm. So we had interesting. We, we, we brought in the editor in chief of Philstar.com, mm -hmm. that's, that's our uh, online portal in the Philippine Star Media Group. We had a veteran journalist, uh, John McKean from Vietnam, yes. uh -huh. and we also had uh, a lawyer who's also a blogger. Because, of course, uh, it's, it's the dynamic, the relationship between journalism mm -hmm. and the blogging community is quite controversial. <laughs> this day, so. Quite interesting and quite controversial. Yes, and we wanted to discuss that. and. Every forum that's organized every day by each news organization, uh, Sunstar had their own forum, Cebu Daily News had their own, even the KDP had their own forum. That's when journalism and comm students go at them. Right, and must have, you know, a lot of insights there. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Like, um, there's a tendency now for organizations or even government to invite bloggers to cover mm -hmm certain events, you know, yeah. side by side with traditional media or news yes. organizations. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I asked you earlier where the, where the word fake news really came from. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really kind of interesting. Um, this is a challenge, I think. Uh, well, Negros Oriental celebrated Press Freedom Week, but not as bonga as uh, you, you mentioned, you know. Um, there was a one-day event where um, by the way, the president of the Dumaguete Press and Radio Club is uh, an officer of mine at Sky Cable. His name mm -hmm. is Wancho Choi. Mm -hmm. Choi uh, Guerrero is also a correspondent yes. in the Freeman Echo. He's he, a correspondent. He, he contributes to our region page. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, he reported that they have invited some speakers, and since the highest issue of the day at that time was uh, the case of hazing of mm -hmm. Chu Castillo. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to listen to one of the congressmen of Negros Oriental, his name is um, Arnie Davis. Mm -hmm. So Arnie came, had some insights of uh, amendments that needed to be done on hazing. And of course it was a fellowship of uh, those who are working full-time with media organizations those who are working part-time with media mm -hmm. organizations, but also those who are doing uh, publicist work for, mm -hmm. for politicians mm -hmm. and so on. And that's, a, and that's an interesting mix, actually. Right. And the academia, I believe. And also yes, and the academia was also invited, including editors of um, school, school publications. And school publications, where they also learn a lot and they interact with those who are doing real journalistic work. And as I mentioned, uh, I think the bigger challenge, especially for Dumaguete City, you know, and Negros Oriental, are for news organizations like radio stations, 
or even print organizations to take care of its own people. Mm -hmm. um, you reporters have to be paid well. Right. They have to be given the benefits that are due them so that they will also be able to have a decent life, you know, especially if they're married and they can send yeah. their children to school. Yeah. Why did I say that? Because the basic vulnerability is economics. You know, if you want to corrupt somebody, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, people who are even receiving millions can, are, can be corrupted. How much more somebody who really wants to act out a living but having difficulties in doing so and making both ends meet. Right. And so it's not really an isolated case in, mm -hmm. in the Logan area. That, that's actually the, the problem of many community journalists across the country, but in other countries, in other countries as well. Yes. Uh, compensation. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one. Yeah. I think they need to review the compensation package and at the same time the recruitment process of people who are going into your uh, the skills media. the skills yes. are very important yeah. the skills and maybe the background itself you know I believe that for one to be a very for one to become a really passionate journalist you should have a certain level of advocacy and belief in something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, belief that you will protect you know? mm -hmm. Uh, in the process of gathering news, in the process, because that's going to grow into somebody with integrity that may be difficult to to tempt, you know. Yeah. But I always go back to, as I said, uh, and a mix. Of, in line with that, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to attract talent and mm -hmm. skills if you it's cannot nice. offer them something yeah. that's worth staying Yes, for. precisely. So what will happen? You'll get somebody who probably has uh, no... Um, viable income, mm -hmm. okay, just looking for um, a place where he can make reports, yeah, and so on. So, you'll end up having people like that in your organization. And so, there's this, as I said, there's an interesting mix of that. And I was talking to Choi actually, and I was trying to, to get him to tell me some of the some of the you know interesting happenings there. And he was telling me that it's basically the same. The need for housing, mm -hmm. you know, the need for housing. I don't know if there's an organization in Cebu that offers housing. We do have a, what we call news co-op. So it's oh, a cooperative yeah. run by the media organizations. So that that's one that's of them. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's really you know that's something. I'm glad that you shared that because I think it's a challenge not only for for Dumaguete but Mindanao or yes, organizations. Yes. Community well. journalists where well, to a certain extent, those working in Manila are lucky because. We have the big establishments there, mm -hmm. uh, big corporations that can offer them uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. But it's more of a challenge to community journalism, news organizations. Yes, okay. So that's one of the aspects that the NISCO op is trying to address. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's good because um, what do you really. I always believe that the, the fourth estate, as we always call it, yeah. uh, when all others fail. You usually go to the news organization. Yes. Okay. And so that means that the integrity of the news organization has to be impeccable. Right. So that uh, the public will be able to have someone or some organization where they can go to that is believable and yeah. uh, you, you believe that they can do something for you. Yeah. I think one of the concerns is really the very thin distinction between someone who's doing uh, serious journalism work and somebody who's doing who's a publicist of organizations mm -hmm. uh, that that promote certain ideology or promote certain um uh, organizations with yeah with biases yeah, okay. okay or even politicians yeah you know, politicians yeah. themselves i mean it is a reality that there are politicians that offer jobs mm -hmm. to those who are already connected with radio stations yes. or television stations yes a reality that yes. is reflective of the industry it is. as a whole, mm -hmm. not only in the Philippines but also in other countries. Yes, and so, well, when you do that, and I don't know if that is debatable, especially for the, those who are viewing us right now, it is really very difficult to be fair and to be independent. Yes. Okay. It Particularly is. for us Filipinos, na may utang na Correct. Yeah. Okay. It can be very cultural. Yeah, it can be very, very basically cultural. So when there is an issue against that particular person, you will think twice about exposing that immediately because then you would look back. I'm going to lose my job there. Yeah. yeah. Or 
my wife who's employed there is right. going to lose that. And, and if you look at the pensions of many politicians, actually, they will use that also as an so advantage. Yes. Yeah, and we can't blame them. And we cannot yeah. also blame them. It's a, it's, it's a it's survival an interesting, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting mix and an interesting reality, which I think goes back to what we were earlier talking about. One, pay them well, capacitate them in terms of skills. Right. And let them train. Because, you know, other professions, they have what they call um, continuous, or what do you call that? Continuing uh, education. Continuing education. And why can't we not do that in journalism? Mm -hmm. Considering that the industry changes so fast. Yeah, it is. It's unprecedented the way things have changed in the industry. In fact, just today, during our Manco meeting at the Filipino Cable Corporation, we were talking about digital media. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the realities that I would like to accept is that I don't, I, yes, I know how to utilize social media, but there is just a nitty gritty of understanding the strengths and the By weaknesses. By the way, that is on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> where else are you? <laughs> I'm on Instagram. <laughs> Oh my goodness. She, she is also. <laughs> she can be called a digital native if you want to call her. <laughs> but you know, uh, there are still many things that you have to learn, Yeah, actually. Um, just recently, Joe, I was invited during the, the convocation at Siliman among pastors. Uh, mm -hmm. It happens usually at the end of, of Siliman Congress Day. And the topic actually was social media, you know, uh -huh. uh, the the bane and the boon yes. of social media. Yes, and it makes you really realize that uh, responsibility of putting something out there, like what we're doing right now. Okay. Yes. This is viewed all over the world, right? You know. Well, during our time, just <laughs> your time, but during our time, it was just radio, it exactly. was just when I was your intern, <laughs> it yes. was just television at that point, mm. and now we're broadcasting live on social media without radio and TV. Yeah, precisely, and, and the data will show that there is a far greater number of people who are actually on social media now. 60% yes. uh, penetration rate. Precisely. Internet in the Philippines. Precisely. Also. And you have the phone with yeah. all the data, with all the free data, wherever you are, yeah. you can view this one. So this is this is to me also an advantage, but at the same time, you must be able to learn how to be responsible. In really? so because my next speaking. question actually will take off from that okay. argument. Because mm -hmm. my, my next question would be, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you what our colleagues in Negros and mm -hmm. the, the kind of challenges they're facing with in covering stories with social media now, mm -hmm. when everyone else can be a journalist, <laughs> can be a reporter. Yes, and, uh, and it's amazing. There's a page, and I just don't want to mention it, but there's a page that actually highlights all the happenings in Umagete. I think I know what that page is. Yes, okay. <laughs> so you see when there is the tricycle that is actually the top and down at the side of the road. Yeah. Or you just see that, you know. We also have a counterpart <laughs> page here in Zulu, actually. <laughs> and you know, various images have various interpretations. Right. And this is, I think, the weakness, too, of Twitter or even Instagram, because you cannot place every information there as accurately as you would want. If you only have 140 characters Precisely. for Twitter, for example, yeah. how do you... It's do already it? 280, I understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some posts, it can be 280. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, and, and secondly, as you said, when you are not trained as a journalist and your mindset is really just to put out everything there so that everybody gets to see it first from you. Yeah. Okay rather than uh, getting all the details before putting it up. I remember that we had a lecturer once who says, forget about scoop, you know. You can out-scoop each other, but I think the most important thing is get the important facts right. first and yeah. do it right. Right, yeah. Because at the end of the day, you may just have to apologize, erratum and right. everything, because, wow, your story was not really that. Right. That's actually our standing policy mm -hmm. in the Freeman Online. Of course, it hurts when someone else gets it first before you did. Yes. But we'd rather have our information correct. Mm -hmm. 
it's okay for us to be late one minute, two minutes, two minutes as long as we didn't get the information. Precisely. So you just have to weigh things, you know. It's almost like you saw you saw a tail, you just whisk it and whisk it until you would know what is in the head, you know. Yeah. It's almost like maybe it's a dinosaur there, maybe it's a snake there, but you wouldn't know unless you're able to uncover that by doing more research. So going back to that, you know, you see something there, you take a picture, put it up. Yeah, that is a lot of interpretation can be done there, you know, depending on which side you were. Yeah, <laughs> if you're on this, on who's uh, looking at it? Precisely, yeah. precisely. Looking at it from the point of view of the police, looking okay. at it from the point of view of the bystander, and so on. So that's why, um, with all of those, I think this is where um, real journalistic work should really be anxiety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if you are in a media organization right now, that should not really put you down. Yeah, I think yeah. you should improve your capability to do research. I agree. Yeah. Because then here you are, they're out, all right? Everybody gets to, to see it in the news. Yeah. But when you put it up in the social media with complete stories and everything, with opinions coming from both sides for you to be fair, then who's the more credible? That should set you apart from yes. everyone else, mm -hmm. and I think that should be the that should be the goal of uh, of everyone. But I still hear some of my colleagues that are saying that that uh, the the pitfall of following those footsteps, mm -hmm. you know, that just because somebody else who's not even trained for any journalistic work mm -hmm. came out with the first uh, scoop there, there's also the tendency to do the same. Yeah, but I think we should go back to exactly what we were expected to do. Interesting point because that's that's actually one of the major takeaways during the press freedom week. Mm -hmm. Because okay. with all this conversation, all this debate, mm -hmm. one of the important lessons from there is that we have to go back to honest to goodness journalism. Mm -hmm. True, correct. Like, well, you say it's fake news, but I'd rather call it. Uh, either it's incomplete or erroneous or mm. because somehow there's a certain element there that could have been done right mm -hmm. you know unless of course you're really well put up something that is definitely fake you know yeah but i read i read some or uh, you know because of the advent of this particular coined word if they don't like your story they can also label that as fake news. <laughs> but your defense will always be the fact that yeah. you did your work, you right. did your homework, you did your research. Yeah. It's based on documents. So you should not be afraid to put it out, you know? If somebody else, whether it's the president or it's somebody up there, will tell you that's fake news, you can defend that because yeah. you have all the backings of research. Yeah. But definitely, if you just get it somewhere else, you know, then your credibility will also be at stake. Right. To extend the conversation further with how things are, are now, mm -hmm. don't you think it's also a good sign that people are more participative, even if they can be very emotional at times with their posts and with what they share? They are more engaged now with social media. And mm -hmm. I think in the early days of the internet and social media, 2011, 2012, it's actually the mainstream media, media that have advocated for citizens to engage mm -hmm. using this platform. Yeah, well, that's the reason why we had live broadcasts, where we open telephone lines, remember, traditionally? Yeah. You have live broadcasts. A lot of people would walk away from that. They don't want the live broadcast because definitely, like this one. Yeah, like this one. <laughs> but if you do want to take part in the conversation, you can also post your comments. You can always participate in the discussion. Correct. So. Yeah, in the traditional media, before the advent of social media, you have live uh, programs like that where you open telephone lines and people can challenge the ideas of the guests, you know, yeah. they don't have to agree, you know, like uh, when I was a teacher, I usually tell my students that these are the things that I know, I'm, I'm a lot older than you, that's probably the, the only reason why I am here, <laughs> right? because I have a lot more experience, but please do not take me hook, line and sinker. I think the only the only exciting thing that you can do is to also challenge, mm -hmm. you know. And so going back to your question, yes, I agree. I think these are the these are the glory days of participation. Mm -hmm. You know. When you put up something there and there's a comment there and then all, all those comments. I my wish is that eventually we will become we will grow 
in our um, perception of things, mm -hmm. you know, and that eventually we will be able to interact with tact mm -hmm. and uh, respect for people for and each other. Yes, yeah. respect for each other. And it has always been our wish in media that people concentrate more on the issues than personalities. Right. But on social media, now that's not... It's the other way around. It's not the other way around. Yeah. You forget about the issue and you... You attack the person. You attack the person. And, well, my only prayer is that eventually somebody will... How do we really intervene? Okay. Yeah. So that people will, will grow in knowledge. Why is it very difficult for those on social media to... to exercise yeah. control? They, we come from different social orientations. Okay. Okay. We come from, I don't know where that person is coming from. Maybe he has an experience being frustrated dealing with government, mm -hmm. you know. And so being a person with that kind of orientation, he brings it right there with all his ire and his anger. Because it's easy. You know, mm -hmm. it's easy. You can just put it out there. And it can be anonymous. Yes. Yeah. Precisely. And that I think that is basically the reason why everybody's so brave about mm -hmm about coming up because you know you can put up an emotic on there whatever and they would even yeah. know who you are so going into that i think um especially for responsible bloggers okay and i think this is a challenge for bloggers too for bloggers to and they're really very popular they're bloggers with yep. hundreds of thousands of followers and if you go back um in history the Blogging in the U.S. actually was very useful to mainstream organization, media organizations because the bloggers in the United States were actually rich sources of information. Yes. These are uh, politicians for what? Public service? Okay. Yeah. And they have become sources of information. Yes. And it can be... It can be a happy collaboration between the yeah. you, the ones, the news organizations, and the bloggers themselves, you know. But even while we have expectations from news organizations like the Freeman and Banna, the same expectations has to be given also for the bloggers. Do you believe that? Yeah, I think uh, when you're a blogger, you have to identify that that is an opinion you're putting out. Transparency, yeah. in other words. I yeah. think transparency is very important because I read a lot of blogs, you know, and there are really interesting insights that I get from bloggers. Yeah. They go to a particular event, then instead of looking at the event itself, they give you an insight of the body language of people that they see. Yeah. Okay. Which sometimes we don't do that because we do hard news. Yeah. Okay. But the bloggers can do that. And it's a big insight for someone like me who is doing write-ups for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But for it to be really exciting, mm -hmm. maybe the blogger can talk to a psychologist, you know, and make it really kind of interesting conversation and say, yeah. look, if I see this and I see that, what do you think is, you know, expanding that kind of... But that will be more hard work. Okay, precisely. Okay. Precisely. So I think, so I think little by little, the bloggers have a role to play in... Uh, information dissemination mm -hmm. then they must also be able to embrace that in the future it's going to be hard work it's going to be hard it all boils <laughs> down the hard work it's still hard work you know so you when you take a picture when it's a food blogger who takes a picture of the food that he ate okay that is also subject to a lot of interpretation okay and if you want to write something about it then you should be able to do a lot of research yeah about food and everything and there's a lot of food bloggers that are so interesting yeah. and really I commend them for that yeah but there are also political bloggers uh, and I think this is where the, the mm -hmm. you know the, yeah. the conversation was about especially with Mokka Usan and, and, and <laughs> others you know uh, but they do have a role to play you know at the end of the day if you don't like what she writes if you think that is, you can also react and put down your thoughts there because it's exactly yeah. what the medium is all about. Yeah. The only, I think the only uh, problem there is when you're working with a government organization, okay, uh, if you're a private citizen, fine, yeah. you find yourself as a private citizen. 
but when you are connected with an information for government and uh, and you put it out there as that's a different resource, story that's an entirely different story mm -hmm. a different story altogether and so uh well i just hope to overt you know, i think that the bloggers do have a, a role to play yes and that is why we invite them in yes. in press conferences now yeah we invite them in big events. Some of them are really good writers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. literary, as a matter of fact. Yeah. There was a time that uh, we were saying, because our training for news writing is really so crisp, you know, and we're not supposed to put in some yeah. of the literary words there that yeah. describes particular imagery. But yeah. I think that's already changing, even yeah. in big news yes. organizations. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a matter of style. A matter of style, yeah. Newsrooms have adopted the non-traditional style <laughs> now. Correct. To make stories more interesting and mm -hmm. engaging. Engaging. Yeah. Because when you use the written word and you use use more poetic words that you know engages the mind more than the the, the, the just uh, the, engages the heart, no? Yeah. More than the mind. It stays there. And it's more challenging now for, for print especially. <laughs> yes. Because if I am a consumer, why else would I read your paper the following day or buy it if I have already read the same story <laughs> in on social media or the day before? Yes, online. So yeah. stories have to be the challenge really is for stories to be more engaging with more depth. Mm -hmm. uh, more so information. More information, more perspective. Complete, yeah. Yes, more, more perspective. perspective. So plenty of your stories with context. So that's a challenge for, for yes. print organizations. And then for, well, for both television and radio organizations, I think that the challenge is basically the same, but I always have to go back again to compensating your people well. Because <laughs> if you expect them to do data, research, yes. and, and everything, it means that it has to be somebody who's doing full-time work with you, right. who's responsible for the organization, yes. and he's not going to wash his hands whenever somebody else is going to complain about his work. Someone who can take accountability, accountability for, for that is the current. You know, I think that's what made this uh, Cebu page, Facebook page controversial because this has become an avenue for citizens to share pictures, information, which has been useful mm -hmm. to, to many Cebuanos, but the problem was transparency and accountability because there was one re post recently that placed the page on a hot seat because they posted something that was very incorrect. Uh, they posted that there was a bomb scare in Lapu Lapu City, which was eventually... It was not true. It wasn't true. And the problem was uh, the, the administrators of the page do not want to identify themselves. Uh, okay, so that so, is really a question of accountability or some transparency. So who should be answerable? Yeah. I think I agree. Because if you're putting out something there which you think the public can embrace or which the public appreciates mm. uh, or if it scares the public, yeah, you have to be accountable. Right. And if you are accountable, you will think twice of putting it up. That's exactly why we have bylines in the paper. Mm. That's why reporters on TV and on radio have to be are identified. identified. Yeah. yeah, that's why we discourage uh, blind items or anonymous or anonymous items as items. much as possible, uh, as much as we can. You yeah. know, unless you really it's a style and then of course you back it up with the facts you know because sometimes in radio work you do style like right, that, so right. people will listen to you yeah but if it's purely just blind item and then and then you you are going to destroy a particular person on the basis of blind item and then at the end of the day you find out that it's not even true right and then you're not even accountable for it so yes that damage has been done mm -hmm. so how is that yeah. So interesting days for interesting days for the industry <laughs> for all of us. For all Let's us. go a little lighter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This time we've been working together for uh, the Sinulog years. Celebration. <laughs> and years. Even in the Sinulog for for those of you who of course for those of you who follow the Sinulog and take part in the Sinulog is going to be January just about two months. Yeah. Two years, three November, months from December. Now. Okay, about two months. Yes, yeah, about two months. But so actually, actually, preparations for the Sinulog have started. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, and you know, even those contingents who participate in the Grand Parade that's are, a, really. are already prepared. So you will hear the drums already. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 
now everything's in place. Yeah, the Sinodo Foundation are starting to make preparations for January. What can you expect? Sky Cable has been very active, especially on the Grand Prix coverage. Yes, we work. We are still that, yeah. yes, we're still doing that and and more. You know, we will um, we will have of course our coverage online. Yes, okay, which we have been doing. Yes, yes. together. And then more than that, when I do covers, and this is kind of interesting, you know, uh, Joe Berth will will forward to me uh -huh. if there's no messenger uh -huh. through text. And it was very challenging last year because yes. they had to cut cell phone signals at the yes. grand parade area for security reasons. That's so we had to go back to traditional, you know, legwork. <laughs> In journalism, so that we because can... when I was hosting, I was hosting the the grand Mardi Gras, and then when you are out there, you need to also share with the public whatever right. is happening in other parts of this, you know, yes, yes. when the parade From is the streets, going. Yeah. And thank you, you know, you provided me a piece of organized situation. What, what was <laughs> happening? There was a, uh, there was a. I think and one of the an electric was yes, yes. busted, you know, right. and everybody thought it was a bomb. Yes, and you know we had a uh, we had a funny story about that because yeah. when that happened, we could not communicate with anyone. In this, our reporters, we could not communicate with them. Our photographers, and our photographers literally had to run from where it happened because fortunately he was there to take the pictures. Uh -huh. So he took pictures, literally, literally ran to the office, to the newsroom, <laughs> so we could post the pictures on social media to inform everyone about what happened. Yes, <laughs> there were a lot of rumors actually, yes. you know, yes. and uh, a credible organization like yours must be able to temper that because, yeah. you know, with all the rumors and, and because we, we we even have to cut off telephone signal because yeah. we don't want any, any of those uh, people who may want to take advantage or yes. use it for some other purposes. And so on the minds of people, there's already that kind of fear, you know, there's a latent fear. And then and there's that boom. Because <laughs> everybody right. was saying, oh, what was that? So it has to be put up. It's really interesting. Yeah. And all the information that we shared with you uh, mm -hmm. during the live coverage were of course coming from the whole team of the Freeman and Bank News. Yes, and I was I am grateful and and uh, We'll be doing basically the same thing. Let's work it out again. That the coverage of Sky will also be on our page. So yes. We will be able to engage more people, especially right. people outside of the country that yes. lives in Sydney. Yes, know? yes. Absolutely. This is, after all, you know, that's what I love most about public service, uh, about journalism, because this is public service. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, without us getting into politics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 that's correct. And it makes our job really satisfying yeah. and, and more meaningful. Um, I realized how close the Sinulog celebration is to a lot of people all over the world. Yes. I remember that somebody from Georgia, you know, Somebody from Georgia took a picture, sent it to us uh, via our chat box, and was telling us about the feeling that he had in a cold country like Georgia, as an OFW, right. looking at his barangay participating in the single dog. And you know how, how yes. beautiful that right. is? Right, the kind of fulfillment yeah. that it gives you. I remember last year there were there were Filipinos, Cebuanos in particular, from other countries sending us pictures yes. of them in Sinulo the Fire at the peak of winter. And yes, at the peak of winter. And you know what, this year, this is still what we're going to do. We will encourage them to take a picture of if this is if this is their laptop or wherever, and if they're near a landmark in Australia and they, you know everything, they're gonna take a picture and they did that last year. Right? Yes, yes, many of them did. Many, many of them did. did. I remember we had pictures from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the Middle East. A lot of pictures from down under, from Hong Kong, from even one who was tracking Kanlaon, amazingly. Huh? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he was in Kanlaon, near the volcano, and he had a signal there. So he was able to take a look, and he sent the message and sent the picture. And see how beautiful that is. You're yes. able to connect a lot of people, and not just Cebuanos. And I think uh, Sinulog is one that connects. Yes. It's a religious event, it's a religious festival, it reminds us of our faith, yeah. and uh, somehow More than that, it, it, it's also cultural. It is. Because even those who are not Catholics also come here 
Yeah, join us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And appreciate what we're doing. Right. All the creativity of the Filipino is amazing. Yes. When you look at the sinulog and the things that they do and the costumes and the headdresses, thousands, thousands of Cebuanos come home every January just to be part of the sinulog. Yes, precisely. So we hope that this year is going to be more exciting. Yes. I mean, next year's sinulog is going to be more exciting. We're doing our preparations now for Sky, but as always, we will be bringing it once again live all over the country through our SD and HD signal. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we will do it online, you know, yes. in collaboration with news organizations like yours and our own page. And that we are driving the, the comments so that more and more people will engage with us. And then I hope we are still get the reports from you. From yes, the yes. <laughs> and I this hope is after all there's no blackout. Huh? <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see in the next few months. <laughs> we are already very excited about it. Like, Sinulo always uh, makes us excited. Excites us. Yeah. And the excitement begins Christmas season. We're ready in the Christmas season and then the Sinulo. So right. it's, it's a long, long time of getting excited. Correct. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm beginning now. It's a kind of preparation that... that uh, it gives you a kind of high, you yeah. know, when you prepare from November all the way to December and then all the way to Sinulo. Right. And then, of course, here at uh, Sky, we cover Dinagyang, which is a historical oh, yes, connect. Yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Immediately after Sinulo, we will cover Dinagyang in Iloilo, which is a historical connect, you know, the bringing of the Santo Niño yes. to the San Jose Church yeah. in, in Iloilo. So that is one whole month of uh, San yeah. Antonio celebration uh, up to Dinagyang. And Dinagyang is also interesting. Very exciting. Yeah. Yes. yes. And the it's, Dinagyang Festival. Yes, it's also exciting from Sinulo all the way to Dinagyang. So, um, well, to answer your question, Sinulo, we're ready and uh, we're ready to work it out with Freeman again. We're very excited yes. for that. <laughs> <laughs> the work that we do every year. <laughs> And we'll see what kind of improvements you can do, especially with my new officer, Cesavi Marquez. <laughs> uh, another set of man who is joined by team here in Cebu. Right. And to wrap this up, uh, I know that you've mentioned some points earlier, but what for you is the best thing about journalism, being a journalist and doing your journalism in the community? Mm -hmm. Well, you ask yourself at the end of the day, why are, why are we here? You know, yeah. Why are we here? Um, I think the kind of satisfaction, personal satisfaction that you get for doing something uh, for the community and for, for making sure that you're doing it the right way. Okay, because you get a satisfaction by people appreciating what you're doing, mm -hmm. but I think that is not enough. I think the greatest satisfaction is when at the end of the day, you think you have done your best in the right way. And until today, I continue to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> and Linda, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank, you thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We are looking forward to our partnership again in the Sinulo coverage. Thank you. And then, like, I wish to thank your organization. Course, yeah. And I wish to congratulate You're your organization welcome. for doing the best you can to be where you are and protecting your integrity as well. This is for the challenges. This is for the public. Yes. As we always say, this is for our public. 5,000 followers or not. <laughs> <laughs> Salamat. Yes, yes, thank okay. you very much. Yes. And to all of you who joined us today, thank you very much for joining the Freeman Conversations. And we look forward to having you again next time. I'm Joe Bertocco, online editor of the Freeman, and thank you for joining us. This is the Freeman Conversations.